I'm a professor of geological sciences at the University of Colorado in Boulder, Colorado, USA. And uh, Steve, are we alone in the universe? So the question is, are we alone in the universe? The, the first blush response to that is, well, it depends on what you mean by we. Okay, what do you mean by we? Well, we can begin by asking ourselves if we means life in this case. Do we have uh, other living things, biological entities outside of the Earth, elsewhere in our galaxy, in our universe? I would say the answer is probably yes, given the history of the universe. So you, wait, you, so you think we, the life forms on Earth, are the only life forms in the universe? Is that what you just said? Let me, let me go back. Okay. Say that I'd like to think that given all of the stars and planets and galaxies and so on that are out there, that we cannot be alone. We as in life forms. You'd like to think. That means you wish that, but what about the evidence? Well, there is no evidence. There is no evidence for life outside of the Earth. Okay. People have presented some evidence. It has failed a number of tests, at least in the Martian example. Some evidence has even been presented that we've received radio signals from other stars. But the problem there, of course, is that it has yet to be duplicated. So as far as I know, there is no evidence that there is life outside of the Earth. However, my opinion is that given the vast scale of just our galaxy and the number of possibilities out there, I would, it seems um, eminently reasonable that there should be other life forms and that we are not alone. So it's eminently reasonable that we are not alone. It is eminently feasible that we are not alone. But didn't you say you, I thought you said earlier that you thought we were not alone. I mean, you thought that we were alone, I'm sorry. Oh, I wasn't, com I hadn't completed my sentence. Okay, properly. all right, now, so, so what you said is uh, the universe is big, therefore we're probably not alone. But doesn't that being alone depend on the probability for the origin of life? I don't know what the probability is for the origin of life. Well, then what does the size of the universe have to do with it? Well, given the conditions that we think are necessary, again, that we think are necessary to get life started, it seems that those conditions are satisfied in simple planetary environments. Liquid water, energy resources, organic raw materials, and the time available to assemble these components together into biological systems. Well, recently there's a lot of progress has been made in finding exoplanets, and uh, it might be the case that every star has some kind of planetary system around it, and a large fraction of them might have rocky planets like the Earth. That means that every, there's life around every star in the universe? I didn't say that. No. I only said that the stage was set. I didn't mean the actors were present. Ah, the stage was set. The actors were not present. Not necessarily. How can you figure out, make it, is there any way to guesstimate whether the actors will be present or not? Well, the first approach, of course, to, to look for whether or not the actors, meaning biological systems, are present on planets around other stars is to look for changes, patterns. Uh, one thing I like to think about is the analogy of uh, an anthill next to a freeway. I mean, do the ants know that the freeway is there? Well, if they are clever ants, they might detect changes in, say, the vibration over the course of time associated with increases and decreases in traffic, and that there's some pattern there uh, we may expect that when life is present, unexpected patterns emerge. One of these may be present in gas composition of atmospheres. That's a popular one. In searching for evidence of life and planets around other stars, you may consider that an abundance of gases outside of thermodynamic equilibrium, such as free oxygen, uh, abundant free oxygen, would be some indicator that can be used to argue that oxygenic photosynthetical life was modulating the composition of the atmosphere of that planet. Another, of course, would be 
radio signals that show some kind of complex, maybe even repeating pattern or a pattern that follows some kind of mathematical law. Okay. Have you ever seen a UFO? Yes. And what, 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 where, when? Give me the details. Well, it's the pure definition of UFO, an unidentified flying object. I was about 15 years old, camping on the shoreline of Acadia National Park uh, in the state of Maine. And I noticed that there was a light uh, over the water. And when I looked up, I saw a tumbling, flaming object um, over the water. I was, of course, perplexed by this. But at 15, I knew enough that if it was present and I observed it, there has to be a physically plausible meaning for this observation that I made. I don't think I was hallucinating. Mm -hmm. And I've concluded now in my adulthood that it was a fireball, a kind of meteoroid. Rather than methane gas on a swamp or something? No, this was over the ocean. Oh. So this wasn't a will-o'-wisp or one of those <coughs> things. So what do, you know, <laughs> what do you know about aliens? I don't know anything about aliens, okay. what except is, what I read in science fiction and I dream up in my own imagination. So what is life? I'm not sure what life is. I, I embrace this, this uh, attitude that we're only beginning to understand something about the properties of life. It, the origin of life itself is one of the most complex problems in science. It's, it's one of the greatest problems in science, kind of like, what is gravity? I mean, we can observe it, we can describe its behavior. We're just not sure what it is. So I wonder if we even have the vocabulary to describe the complexity of life. Do you think we need a definition of life? Definitions provide a useful guide that you can use to direct your energies focused on improving your answer. But there's a big problem there. And the problem is a philosophical problem, obviously, that if you have a definition for something, well, that how accurate is that definition? How close is the definition to the truth? If you define two, as a quantity being equal to one plus one, well, one, one can define that, but it's difficult to imagine how two separate entities can, can be joined somehow to create a new entity called two. And I think the problem of life is infinitely more complex than that simple logic problem. What do we know about the origin of life on this planet? I like to say that we who study the origin of life take several approaches to it, working with present life forms and then trying to work our way back to uh, less and less complicated things to give us an idea of the original nature of life. Or we start with what we think were the beginning ingredients, assemble them somehow, and model their evolution. But these two approaches have one thing in common, is that it's all past tense. Because these events occurred in the past, we have a different impression of them. It's different from interpreting what will happen in the future. If I say, all right, well, what's going to happen tomorrow? I'm not sure, but I think the sun is going to rise and set apparently with the spin of the earth and that I'll have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That's my expectation, but it's filled with unknown. But for some reason, when we look at the past, we think we know everything because it happened in the past. Therefore, we understand it better. I would argue that we understand the origin of life less because we think we know how it began. Oh, we think we know how it began? Yeah. Who thinks we know how it began? Well, it goes back to these ingredients. We think that it requires energy resources, organic raw materials, liquid water, and the time <coughs> to assemble all of these things together. We also think that it happened on the Earth, because that's where life is. 
What if none of those things are true? Oh wait, th that life does not need those ingredients? Correct. And it happens somewhere else. It happens somewhere else. Yes. Okay. And uh, how plausible is that? The only way to test its plausibility is to go out and see if there are metaphors for life elsewhere, planets like Mars or in the interior of asteroids or beneath the veiled uh, ocean, ocean or the, the icy crusts of uh, moons of the outer solar system. Because if you go to any one of those other places and if you find a hint or an echo of life and its chemistry is somewhat different from ours, one might say that we know even less about how life began because it turns out that there, there's a panoply of ways to arrive at a similar answer. Well, some people think that there's an RNA world first and information first. Other people think, no, it's metabolism first. Other people think, no, membranes first. Do you have any uh, preference for those, any of those? Well, we, if you trust in the cellular theory of life, then life is encapsulated. So viruses are not life then? Correct. So are, do you think viruses are life? I, I do not think that they are life. I think that they are biological machines, for lack of a better term, for them. Because left by themselves, they're, they do almost nothing. They degrade with time. Isn't that the same as the RNA world? There are no the cells RNA there. world, uh, we don't know if there are cells or not. It's difficult to imagine a naked gene planet. The, shell, the cells, in place of the cells, uh, RNA could be adsorbed to a mineral surface. I don't really know, but one thing is for sure. I do have a preference for the following uh, chain of ideas, that the origin of life, if it is the origin of Darwinian evolution, then the origin of Darwinian evolution must be the origin of inheritable information. So let's talk about, sometime, I think Carl Woos calls this the Darwinian threshold. Now, what, what, is, what does that term mean? What do you mean the origin? What does it mean to me, the Darwinian threshold? Yeah, or you said the origin of Darwinism, and I'm wondering, you said the beginning of inheritance, you said? The, the beginning of the transmission, regardless of the fidelity of inheritable traits, in other words, of information from ancestor to descendant, from parent to offspring, you might say. Well, Rob Hazen would say, oh, the rocks do that. They don't do it uh, so well. Uh, they often you reach... In, you said they, uh, Just a moment. <laughs> just a moment. <laughs> okay. They reach dead ends quite quickly. Clays have been used as an example. Haldane did this long ago. Karen Smith was a champion of it in the 70s and 80s. The idea is that a clay particle can template formation of more clay particles. But is that really transmittal of inheritable information? Well, uh, what's different about it, of course, is that going back to this threshold uh, of Darwinism, you, the idea, however Aristotelian that it is, start simple and work to complexity, the idea is that that chemical evolution would eventually transition to Darwinian or biological evolution. And the way I view the RNA world is that it's a transition time between this pre-RNA world and then the DNA peptide world that we have. So is there life in an RNA world? Yes. But not viruses? No, but viruses provide an interesting guide I mean, there are many RNA viruses. Ebola is an RNA virus, HIV, and other things. What is Prions, the... even. I mean, they're not viruses. Right, you know? right. They're inheritable information in, in proteins. They're peculiar substances. So, what, sometimes we talk about the selection pressure and a unit of selection. Do you think that knowing what the unit of selection is required for, uh, for life? Or... What is a unit of selection? I guess whatever is being either survives or not, whatever can leave more offspring or not. I see. So let's imagine a, uh, a pool of proto-organisms that are simple and therefore they are plastic in their genomes 
In other words, their simple genomes are similar to one another such that they can exchange in a primitive form of lateral gene transfer yeah. with one another. Well, in such a pool, uh, a new selection pressure, if it would appear, would cause a kind of catastrophe to this pool. What's an interesting fact about catastrophe, of course, is that in the wake of catastrophe, we find new systems emerge, and occasionally these systems emerge with greater complexity than in the parent system. Okay. So one can imagine in a pool of plastic proto-RNAs, in a genomic, a simple genomic pool, that a very strong selection pressure comes along much like uh, Darwin's finches, and soon afterwards one finch species gives rise to 14 based on the individual requirements of the ecolog ecological niches inhabited by these organisms. In principle, I can, in my mind, apply this uh, to these primitive organisms. Now, a lot of, some astrobiologists think, you know what, we're trying to figure out what we should expect life to be elsewhere. And then they say, well, let's look around life on Earth and see if there's anything that has happened that has evolved independently multiple times and if it has evolved multiple times independently, then that becomes a good candidate for what we should expect elsewhere. What do you think of that logic? I'm going to take this logic and I'll test the logic with an example. Uh, singularity versus multiple occurrences in parallelism. So singularity, which occurs in the history of life, is another peculiar fact of biological or Darwinian evolution. Multicellular organisms appear like a singularity and give rise to animals, plants, and fungi with exchange in lateral gene exchange and by incorporation of cells within cells in endosymbiosis. What you end up with, of course, is an organism that is not colonial. It's an organism where in each cell of the organism is a cell of that organism. But each cell is divided into different cells of specialist function. Well, that's different from a colonial organism. Colonial organisms like ants and termites and bryzoans and whatnot each component of that colonial organism is an individual. Even if that individual is specialized, each individual has a separate genome. And there are 100 to 150 occurrences in the fossil record of independent rise of colonial type organisms. But as far as I'm aware, multicellularity is a singular event. Well, Andy Knoll has written a a couple of papers about the complex multicellularity being having evolved multiple times independently. And uh, I guess, in general though, do you think that's a good technique to look around to try to find things that are evolved independently and then say, oh, that's a good candidate for elsewhere? Well, complex multicellularity is just another way of saying that you've already crossed over the threshold of making a multicellular organism, yeah. an individual composed of cells of that individual with specialized function. Now with that, that basis, then one creates new ecological niches and fills them in a flowering of diversity. But that's not independence, though. No. That's not independent. The reason why I'm asking this is because I, I'm, I'm on the, I guess I think, well, Simon Conway Morris has written a, essentially a couple of Bibles about, oh, everything's con everything uh, it can evolve independently. The eye has evolved multiple times independently. And I said, wait a minute, they all had common ancestors. It's all deep homology. And so there's a debate, but, and it's a very important debate because if deep homology is the answer, then everything we talk about, you can't talk, about its independent evolution, for example, for they have a common ancestor. Everything has a common ancestor on Earth. So there's no such thing as independent evolution. But he would talk about the eyeballs being independent and multicellularity being independent. So do you have a, do you stand somewhere in this divide? 
two points. So the first having to do with um, independence. Now, you use the eyeball example. Now, it's, what's frequently confused in, in discussions of, 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 the, of the emergence of a trait yeah. is that evolution isn't a drunken walk necessarily. It can be a drunken walk, but it, it has confines of that walk that it, that it can't escape from because it has to follow rules. So I won't, just because I want to, sprout another head or have a different kind of eye. I mean, that's, that's Lysenkoism, essentially. So the issue that I have is that you, you have to keep in mind, and here's my second point, you have to keep in mind that, that parallel evolution should be the expected result given a basis in biochemistry, that you have rules to work with that respond to physical stimuli, which are in turn based on physical laws. Right, but that parallel evolution is not independence. They have a common ancestor, these things, and because they have a common ancestor, they have these common constraints. Yes, because they, they have the same building blocks to work okay. with. Okay, so that means that this logic that of hoping to find independent evolution of X on Earth and then saying, ah, therefore I can extrapolate it, you don't think is a good way to go. To me, that's troublesome. Okay. Because it's, it goes back to my, my point about uh, futurism versus historicity. Because what, what we forget is that, yes, we don't know the future, but there's much that we don't know about the past. Yes. Okay. And we shouldn't let that, that bias guide our thinking. Okay, now Stephen Jay Gould has talked about the metaphor of replaying the tape of life, and he's back to the Burgess or, or the Cambrian explosion, and he says, oh, if we did that, then human beings are very, very, very unlikely to evolve again, and we wouldn't see anything like the kind of things we see today. And uh, other people say, oh, no, no, everything is convergent, and therefore we should see very similar things. Do you have a view on that? Now, this, this actually, you mentioned uh, Conway Morris. Yes. I'm familiar with his views yes. on that, which are at odds with that uh, with espoused Jimmy. by Gould. Yes, very much so. Well, there are, as you know, life has, uh, has consistently followed the advice of the famous uh, baseball player and uh, Yankees manager of American baseball legend, Yogi Berra, who said, when you get to the fork, fork in, in the, the road, road take, take it. it. <laughs> so life takes forks in the evolutionary road. In other words, that road is defined by changes in the conditions of the planet uh, over the course of geologic time, sprinkled with stochastic effects, such as where the continents happen to be configured at any particular point in time, which governs climate, which governs the carbon dioxide cycle, which then governs the, the oxygen cycle. And then occasionally, you get whacked by a meteor that uh, eradicates the dominant animal life of the planet at that time. So rewinding the tape back just 200 million years and running it forward without the Cretaceous Paleogene impact, I am certain that you and I would not be having this conversation today with this uh, so-called modern technology. And it's unclear to me that whether mammals would be dominant at all, and why not birds? Well, how about the idea of in intelligence? Would intelligence evolve again? Would telescopes be reinvented? Would intelligence have evolved again? Human-like intelligence that Human -like can make telescopes and microscopes and so science. So, and... intelligence that's technological in its expression. Yeah. Because one can imagine a water world with intelligent whale-like things singing to one another in complex harmony. And doesn't even uh, have to imagine. <laughs> and uh, yes, except our whale-like things called whales on this planet don't seem to have um, a tremendous amount of information content in their songs. Uh, analysis has shown this. Um, 
indeed, even if the songs are informative to whales and are maybe perhaps even entertaining to them, there doesn't seem to be many bits or bites in there. But given that, a technological civilization, in my mind, requires that you harness chemical energy in the form of fire. You have to be able to smelt metals. You have to be able to build electrical circuits and finally construct micro mines called computers that help you solve problems and build more and more powerful telescopes and, okay, so and better and better instruments for communicating with you, one another. You so think that would I, I would say I would say what gave rise to us, if we were to stick with the bias of our, of our single sample and keeping in mind the genetic difference between Homo sapiens and say, pan troglodytes, you know, like bonobo chimpanzees, it's very, very small. It's something like less than one and a half percent that they, bonobos are interesting creatures but they don't have much in the form of, of uh, technology and culture. So I would say no. I would say that, that, that it goes back to this, this principle that I'm fond of these days, that in response to catastrophe, that the survivors or the surviving system gives rise to processes in many ways often more complicated than the progenitor. In the case of human history, the bottleneck in human population with climate change in Eastern Africa, uh, within the, about 130 to 170,000 years ago, reduced our population to critically low numbers. And this, um, this compels me to think that the survivors of that were able to then acquire new means for adjusting to an enormously variable range of environments from the from the savanna to to the subarctic and in their migrations and in doing so they met uh, distant cousins in Homo erectus and Neanderthalensis and Florensis and others uh, the Denisovans and whatnot for which we have almost no record, that those organisms, those pr proto-humans, as it were, they physically evolved to their environment. They probably survived because they had a physical adaptation of having lived in subarctic environment, for instance, like the Neanderthals for several hundred thousand years. But what made Homo sapiens sapiens different, which I believe was in response to this bottleneck in the population in East Africa, but for which the mitochondrial Eve is evidence of. But bottlenecks would be, I would assume, on every planet there that has some life on it. And, all, and but the and difference here, are all there too. The difference here goes back to my chimpanzee example. Try to herd and seat 200 chimpanzees in an airplane. People do it. People, humans just file on in. You read that by, in Sarah Hurdy's book. I and they cooperate with one another. Now, and they sit themselves down. Now we have to train civilization to our young. They won't just do this naturally. But that's part of the adaptation too. And do you have a favorite solution to Fermi's paradox? Yes. So Fermi's paradox to recapitulate just so that we understand one another, is as I understand it, the, the problem that the universe is so old and there have been so many opportunities for life to have arisen in the past, and in the intervening millions, hundreds of millions, or even billions of years, one would expect that the sky would be filled with spacecraft. But it's not. And my personal solution to the Fermi paradox is that, yes, life has emerged many, many, many times, continues to emerge elsewhere in the galaxy or, or the universe, but that the, the intervening space between these emerging 
life forms and the intervening time between these emerging life forms is very, very great. It's and very furthermore... Great. So you think that life is short then? I think that, uh, just a moment, that the intervening space between the stars is very great, perhaps insurmountable, because either you have to live very, very long or, and you don't die of boredom on the trip, or you don't live at all, you be, have machine life that does it, or you go to sleep and wake up by the time you get there. Um, my, my thinking is that the Fermi paradox can be explained in that intelligent life is relatively rare and that when it appears, the interval of its appearance, the recurrence interval is very, very long. And that given enough time, these organisms, whatever they were, become so advanced that we, like the ants in an anthill next to the freeway, don't even realize that they're there. And presumably the lifetime of the civilization is important here. Yes. Uh, lifetimes of civilizations on the order of a billion years means that these civilizations are more advanced, uh, let's say, than we are in comparison to a paramecium. Is the question, are we alone, an important one? The question, are we alone, is a natural one. It's the kind of thing that a person asks when they have the knowledge of the physical world out there. And given that we know our Earth orbits the Sun, like the other planets of the solar system, each planet is different. The only one that looks hospitable for life is the one that we're living on. But then now with the understanding that there are planets around other stars and almost every star that we see in the sky has a planet around it, perhaps multiple planets, that the odds are very good that there's something Earth-like out there. So to me, the question, are we alone, is the ultimate challenge of looking at ourselves in the mirror. So is the unexamined life not worth living? How, how important is astrobiology? You, you seem to have studied astrobiology and presumably because you're curious about your place in the universe. Has that made you a better person? Astrobiology, it's a youthful field. And with that preface, I'm going to remind everyone that it's a field for which very little data are available. More data are forthcoming, but no data, no truth. One can speculate, but I think that the best theories are the ones that make predictions. So the more we learn with an astrobiological focus that is interdisciplinary, that recognizes the, the overlap and interconnectedness of life with the origin of our planet, that understanding astrobiology is understanding life's context in the universe and the interaction between the biological and the non-biological physical chemical world. Is that a good thing? Does it make that, you a better person? It's an important thing. It's, um, it's, not, a, it's not a moral qualification for goodness. But I think what it does is it, it compels us to ask the question, well, if we're not alone, then are we still special? If we're not alone, are we still special? You think we need to be special? Yes. <coughs> you need to feel special? Yes. Why? I like to think that my mind, which I've owned since I was born, which I've cultivated and grown with knowledge and experience and the love of my family and friends, makes me special. And I want to share knowledge and love with those who I care about. Are the trees behind you special, the bushes? Yes. So all life forms in, are special? It is. So humans are unique just like every other species. Yes.
Okay, why should anyone care about astrobiology? Because it's a new way of asking questions about ourselves that is purely within the scientific worldview. It doesn't require an invocation of a mythological worldview. Astrobiology is the study of life in the universe. And astrobiology's premise is that there is life elsewhere in the universe for us to, to explore for and, with hope, discover. Uh, now, you've taught astrobiology, I presume, and uh, what have been, in your experience, the students' biggest misconceptions about this field? A common misconception that I often encounter in office hours about halfway through the semester is that the student believes that I am trying to change a sacred worldview that they've been taught. And in doing so, I'm harming them. Often, and this happens every semester that I teach an astrobiology course to, to beginning students in college. Often, there's an existential crisis. And one in particular comes to mind early in my career as a, as a professor. A student came in feeling very, very powerless in their ability to explain to their family members during a holiday weekend what it is that they've learned at college. Because they realized that what they had been told about the origin of life and about the Earth's place in the universe and the place of humanity in the universe had no factual basis. And the student in their crisis asked what I do. And I replied, I use it as a growth experience because it's part of growing up, is realizing that you're not the center of everything after all. You can be special because you're important to yourself and to others. And you can be a steward of these special life forms and this environment, this world that we live in, which I think we need to take very seriously. But you realize that, of course, we're not the center of everything. And much like the analogy of, a, of the life is like a bird flying through a window, attending a sumptuous banquet for a few seconds, and then flying out the window, is make the best of it with the time that you have. But surely there must be some uh, legitimacy to the, to the complaint that learning astrobiology undermines a religious worldview that they have held on to and was very important to them and to many people. If there's a, a mythological worldview that says knowledge is the root of all evil, it is a mythological worldview that I think requires a serious revisit. So do you have any advice for students who are thinking about becoming astrobiologists? Advice for, yeah, words of advice for young people in astrobiology. Question, and if you don't understand something, write it down. Make a list for yourself of things that you ought to learn. And there are people out there, many of them are very busy, but they'll take the time to spend the time with you, to share with you their experiences in the, the road to knowledge. And another thing, this is an important one. In astrobiology, like all other disciplines, whether music, art, uh, engineering, what have you, is that you can be looking around you and see nothing. But keeping in mind that if you just change your perspective a little bit, 
Maybe you'll see something new that no one has seen before. And most of what we've discovered is because people took the time to change their perspective. What kind of aliens would you like to find? Your emotional view on this. Forget about your rational head. What about your emotions? So I'm going to, um, maybe I'll, uh, I'll put the ego aside for a minute and I'll invoke the id. I have to, I have to answer that question in the most honest way possible. So it's not about what I would like to find in terms of aliens, but I expect that if we do find technologically sophisticated aliens, that we will be horrified. All oh, right, but that's a kind of a rational response. I would have hoping for an emotional response. Maybe you could close your eyes and get in touch with your emotions and say, what your emotional side of you, most of, your, most of you, I presume, what kind would you like to find, your, your emotional What I would state? like, that I would be happiest to find? Yes, yes, the happiest you okay, want to. Okay, be, because, because my expectation is that what we will find will, will be so utterly horrifying That's what you said, to that was your rational part of talking. I want your irrational, your emotional side. Explorers. You want to find aliens? Explorers. Not conquerors. <laughs> okay. Explorers, but not conquerors. Okay. Are we alone? No. Why? Because the ingredients of life are commonplace in the universe. The universe has enough time to have assembled those ingredients, ingredients together to make life forms not just once. But ingredients are one thing, recipe is another. Maybe the recipe is really cockamamie, improbable, improbable. Maybe, Maybe. But, but that's just as likely as saying that the recipe is, is mundane and commonplace. So we as scientists have no way of evaluating how quirky or how common this recipe is? Not until we find another example. And we haven't found one yet. No.